Good morning. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> I just remembered. Hi. Good morning. Hi, Tanya. Hi, Michelle. I just remembered I didn't send Catherine a, a notice before I got on. Oh, there she is. Catherine, I was just saying, hi, everybody. I forgot to send you a notice before I signed on, and it's a later time than usual, so I'm glad you got the ping. Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody? Um, that's a very long handle there. <laughs> Do you guys follow Radzi? She's in India. She's a sweetie. Good morning. Good morning. She was. Uh, she has a scope today that I put out on Twitter. She's been making malas as a way to keep her focus off of food. That's pretty creative. And then so she's selling them just to recover her costs. You were keeping checking because it was so late. Yeah. I had a hard time getting going this morning. Uh, so the oregano update is, uh, I think I took too much that first day, and it really did make a difference in how I felt. I felt a whole lot better. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, so then I put the oregano on my feet yesterday, but I only remembered to do it in the morning. I forgot to do it again in the afternoon. So this morning I woke up, you know, gross. <laughs> and, uh, so today I'm going to take two drops in a capsule internally three times today. And so I'm going to stretch the, the, the oils out longer over the day and see if I can at least keep it at bay if not, um, get rid of it entirely. So I just realized I look like I'm a little old lady off to the opera or something with my cardigan <laughs> and my sort of mall of pearls and my weird glasses. <laughs> so I just look like I just stepped out of the fifties. So, <laughs> so today is our Byron Katie Dow Du Jean book. I think I'm on too late. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I think I'm on too late for Nina. She's probably teaching. Thank you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> you guys are so sweet. Hi, Rhonda. So, Linda, my goodness. <laughs> um, okay, let's let's read. <laughs> Hi, Linda. So we're gonna do our. We're, we're reading these two translations of the Tao Te Ching, along with our Byron Katie book, A Thousand Names for Joy. Yahoo! These books are quickly becoming my favorites. And my name is Michelle Wolf, and you can find me at CaddyshackDesigns.com. And across the top are tabs for my coaching and Young Living Oils and Reiki and the stuff, cat stuff that I do. Good morning, good morning. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Sorry I'm so late, guys. I just couldn't get my, couldn't, couldn't get it together. So, we're on chapter eight. Thank you. <laughs> I'm super congested, but okay. So let's do our readings and let's talk about pain versus suffering. Because when I'm, when I'm sick, thank you. The concept of pain versus suffering um, gets real clear, or it really was getting clear this morning. When I woke up unable to breathe today. So, chapter 8 in this book. True goodness is like water. Water's good for everything. It doesn't compete. It goes right to the low, loathsome places and so finds the way. For a house, the good thing is level ground. In thinking, depth is good. The good of giving is magnanimity. Magnanimity. That's all right. Of speaking, honesty, of government, order. The good work of the good of work is skill, and of action, timing. No competition, so no blame. No competition, 
so no blame. That is important to our discussion later. Her notes say, A clear stream of water runs through this book from poem to poem, wearing down the indestructible, finding the way around everything that obstructs the way. Good drinking water. <laughs> uh, in Tai Chi, if you've ever taken a Tai Chi, Chuan, Tai Chi class, the uh, benefit I like about Tai Chi over karate or something is it meets the energy and goes around it or over it or under it. Uh, it it moves everything to the side instead of impact on impact like karate and uh, what's the other one? Uh, taekwondo. Whack. You're meeting impact with impact. And you are sending your energy through. But Tai Chi is like water. It reminds me of this the Tao that we're reading, it goes around. Uh, when you meet your opponent, you use their strength against them or you just bypass it. It's pretty cool. Take my dough. Uh, let me get some warmth in my throat here. Oh, anyway, Radzi is a really um, sweetheart of a late young woman. I don't know how old she is. She looks very young, but I don't know. Over in India, you might want to follow her. She does some cute stuff. I don't know why I'm using the word cute. She's just adorable. But the stuff she talks about is interesting. So now this one. The Supreme Good Taekwondo. Oh, yes. <laughs> I get it now. Yeah, it's just, it's just really hard to spell. It's definitely not phonetic. The supreme good is like water, which nourishes all things without trying to. It is content. Content. I've been thinking about my blog too much. Let me start over. The supreme good is like water, which nourishes all things without trying to. It is content with the low places that people disdain. Thus it is like the Tao. In dwelling, live close to the ground. In thinking, keep to the simple. In conflict, be fair and generous. In governing, don't try to control. In work, do what you enjoy. And in family life, be completely present. When you are content to be simply yourself and don't compare or compete, Everybody will respect you simply by being yourself, stopping the comparison. Let me see if I can get it to focus enough because it's so tiny you might be able to get a screenshot. It looks kind of fuzzy, but maybe you can screenshot it. Both of those translations end with the don't compare. That you being you gets everything done. It nourishes all things without trying to. Um, when you are content to be simply yourself and don't compare or compete, everybody will respect you. So pain versus suffering comes from comparison and competition. But what was interesting when I was thinking about this this morning is that comparison can be day to day. So like we, I was thinking about how we suffer so much when we're sick. Like we get sick and we add so much suffering to it that's so unnecessary. In part, that's coming from comparing how I felt yesterday as to how I felt today. Thanks for the shares, ladies. I appreciate that. And the hearts, hearts are extra pretty combinations today. So every day I get up and I compare it to the day before. How do I feel today? And I'm always thinking about that in terms of how I felt yesterday or how I'm anticipating I may feel tomorrow. So I woke up this morning in pretty bad condition and uh, with the, this head cold thing. And I was like, oh my God, I feel like hammered shit. I feel like I've been run through a knot hole backwards. I feel horrible. I didn't feel this horrible yesterday. And oh my God, I have the twins again tomorrow. What if I feel worse tomorrow? These were the these were the things literally I was thinking when I woke up because I felt so gross. 
hammered shit. Yes. <laughs> Have you never heard that before? Um, mean as a butch, uh, mean as a gut shot bobcat. How about that one? Oh, <laughs> don't spit out your coffee. Right. If I, I could compare it to a, a, a different day, today would have been awesome. Or I could just compare it to no day and accept what is as is today. Run through a knot hole backwards is my favorite one because, you know, like when a cat is sick and all its hair stands on end and it's all like all over the place. Like Bloom County. What was that crazy cat in Bloom County where his hair was all over? Was his name Bill or Bob or something weird like that? When you are content to be simply yourself, and that means simply, in my interpretation, in the wolf interpretation of the Dowdy Jing, um, for today anyway, that means being simply yourself in yourself. Like what previously when we talk about being ourselves, animal and baby metaphors, different cultures. Oh, oh, it's a cartoon strip. Bloom County. Google it, Linda. It's hilarious. B-L-O-O-M County. Wallered by the dogs under the house. <laughs> Bill. Bill the cat. I knew my mom would know if she was still on here. Such a great cartoon strip. Um, so Bill the cat looks like he's just been shaken inside a bag and dumped out. He looks terrible. He's crazy. That's how I feel. So when we say, oh, just be yourself. And by being yourself, you you do without doing, right? By being fully present and being yourself, you do without doing. But uh, I hadn't applied that to just being yourself in every moment if you're sick. <laughs> because that's where the suffering part comes in. I have the pain of being sick, of my body doing its job but really my body's just doing its job so it's a little painful it's uncomfortable um, that's the fact part right there there is pain in the body period the whining that comes after that is the storytelling that's where the suffering happens so I'm not just being myself when I'm sick I'm fighting against it I don't want to be sick. So I freak out and I go and look up all the oils and I drink a lot of tea. But I found an underlying pretty strong anxiety of I don't want this to go any further. Like I have this cold and I'm going to do everything I can to make it stop. Rather than just relaxing and letting my body do its work with the support of oils and teas and um, yeah, so I didn't realize that I was adding to my suffering. Oh, good. <clears throat> Excuse me. My fighting against this illness is actually stressing my body out, which is going to, if we project forward possibly, make it last longer. So my body has this all its energy going toward taking care of this for me. I don't have to do anything. My body's doing it. It's taking care of this for me. I'm supporting it as best I can. And then I add to it by pressuring it to hurry up. Hurry up, body. Hurry up and get this shit taken care of. I don't I don't want this to go to my lungs. I have then I go into that story. I have a uh, weakness in my lungs and if it goes in my lungs, I could be dealing this with this for months and it goes around and around. <coughs> so today I was like Maybe I could just allow the pain to exist and not heap a whole bunch of shitty suffering on top of it. By not arguing and fighting and worrying about where it might go. It's not going there today. Today there's just some pain. Um, and I can allow that to end. The fact is, <clears throat> there is pain. I don't need to add all the other garbage on the end of it, which creates fear which creates pressure that then my body's having to process more. If I have anxiety going on, I'm pumping out stress hormones. So my body has to deal with whatever this cold or virus or flu is. It doesn't really matter. You know, you've all had it. Um, and it has to process these stupid stress hormones that I'm heaping on top of it. 
<clears throat> so it's kind of like whipping a horse that's too tired. You need to just let the horse do its thing and walk itself home. You don't have to add a whip to it. That's just making everything worse. Um, so in terms of day-to-day practical life, which I always try to bring all this stuff back to, we need to just be ourselves even when just being ourselves looks like a head cold. So we think about, oh, just be yourself. That sounds super positive, right? Like, oh, just be your shiny self and do your shiny soul stuff. And it's so beautiful and awesome. And it is. But head cold days are not beautiful and awesome. But we still need to just be ourselves. This face is not the face I woke up with. (laughs) This face took a lot of work. (laughs) I woke up with a completely different face and a completely different voice. So you see what I'm saying? This is making sense. Just be yourself. Whatever that self is for the day. Don't heap a bunch of garbage on top of whatever you're going through. (laughs) Thanks for... Thank you, Linda. (laughs) it's always that tangled up thing that we do with our minds of we want to let it all go but sometimes we're trying so hard to let it all go that we're pushing away the things that need to be let go of let me explain that sometimes we're trying so hard to let it all go that we're pushing against the things that need to be let go of What I mean by that is we can get tangled up in this concept of the Tao and the way and all the other religious things that we talk about of letting things roll on through. If we keep that as a mental construct and we're still disconnected from our body, the feelings will arise really quietly and we'll push them away and we'll say, we'll say, oh, I'm going to let that go. Boop. I was just going to, it's coming in. I feel it coming up in me and I'm just going to shove it to the side because I'm letting it go. That's not letting it go. That's pushing it aside. So I caught myself doing that again. Hopefully y'all can relate to this. Um, I caught myself doing that, uh, I could be a narcissist. I think about myself a lot. (laughs) I'm observing myself all the time. Maybe let's call it a scientist instead of a narcissist because that's not a very nice word. Um, So I have had a money thing come up, a money fear come up. Introspective. Yes, let's call it that. I'm not narcissistic. I'm introspective. (laughs) I just realized me, me, me. It's all about me. Yeah, so I'm analytical. So Tanya has an analytical mind, too. I'm a skeptic. I'm, I have a scientific mind, uh, which is always at war with this soul part of myself that's so strong, too. So I have, like, this constant um, back in my back and forth with this really soulful part of myself that's like, mm, whatever, just let it go, just roll the flow, whatever. And I can live my life that way a lot. And then I get my scientific mind that's like, analyzing and picking and um, observing and anyway I know you know what I'm talking about so I had a a little twinge of fear oh good (laughs) I'm probably preaching to the choir right once we believe something we've examined it fully that's right yeah I'm super nasally I'm sick sorry I am super nasally it's like an annoying Anyway, um, I said, I caught myself saying to myself, just let that go. Just let that go. And then it came back and I was like, um, excuse me. I said, just let that go. Hello. I issued an order two hours ago that said, just let that go. (laughs) What happened is I made a mistake in my checking account. I've done that twice lately. And I know that that happens from being fearful. So I'm making my money situation actually worse by doing simple math mistakes. So in that way, I'm creating my storyline. So that's a different conversation. 
So this sphere comes up. I told it to, I said, just let that go. Just let it go. It's okay. Just let it roll on through. But that's not what I was doing. I was shoving it to the side. It needed attention. It was pain. And it needed acknowledgement. And it came up again a few hours later. And I was like, wait a damn minute. I said, let that go. And then I heard the harshness in my feeling in my um, head. And I was like, oh, you can label letting it go all you want to. But there's letting it go and then there's really letting it go. Letting it go means letting it arise, be felt, be acknowledged. Then there is no letting it go. It dissipates on its own. Issuing an order to let it go is just another way of rejecting and adding to your shadow part. Okay, so it's the same words, but the process is entirely different. And that second process is what creates suffering. Because that pain has gone uh, unacknowledged. So letting myself just be aware of the pain in my body of a cold, it just dissipates on its own. The awareness of it just dissipates on its own. Fighting against it and trying so hard not to feel pain. Hiding under the covers in hopes it goes away. Yes. We're like, shoo shoo, get out of here. And I'm going to label that letting it go. And that's not the case at all. Truly letting it go is letting it. When you get that awareness that you have a fear or something. Let's just use fear. So you get the awareness that you've got a fear, you've got some under, you've got some anxiety, you catch yourself being like on edge or whatever, and you take a look and you're like, oh, I've got some fear here. If you can, step away from what you're doing and go journal. Like, hey, fear, what do you want to tell me? Or what? Trace it back and go, okay, what, what triggered this fear? Typically, it's a lie that you told yourself. Um, like, Oh, I made a mistake in, in my checkbook, and now everything's fucked up, and now I'm never going to figure this out, and why can't I take my checkbook, and I'm going to end up a bag lady on the streets of Atlanta, you know, all the, you know, all the stuff that comes after that, and that's not where I went with it, but I have done that in the past. So, or I can sit down and journal about it, and go, oh, I've made mistakes in my checkbook in the past that were pretty disastrous. But then everything worked out. We don't leave that part, right? We don't go there. We just tell the terrible story. We forget to tell that. But then it all worked out. Like it was shitty, but then everything happened or somebody showed up or I found money somewhere else or it's really not that big a deal. It's temporary. In this case, it's not that big a deal. It's a auto ship cat food order that I completely forgot about. So it's not a huge deal. It just means we pinch back for a week. That's not worth getting upset about. But I needed to sit down and acknowledge it and just listen and write it out, think it through or whatever and feel it through is what I should say. Feel it through. Then I'm not suffering anymore. So the fact still exists this checking account number doesn't say what I would like it to say. That's the fact. <clears throat> it says this particular number, and that's it. I don't need to add a bunch of bullshit on the end of that. Because everything works out. We're still here, right? So obviously we've had things happen in our lives that were terrible, and they worked out. Because we're sitting here talking to each other today. So uh, there's letting it go and letting it go. <laughs> And there's pain versus suffering. And now um, let's get to what we were actually supposed to do today. Um, read the corresponding chapter in this book, which is chapter 8. I forgot for a second. Oop. In case we're in the middle or if we have people on the web, that's my website, cashhackdesigns.com. You can find me there. You guys, when you ask, it's very hard for me to describe my coaching style, but this is, what you see is what you get. You'll say something and I'll help you pick it apart. That's the bottom line. And we pick it apart until it's over. Oh, did you hear that? It was a gunshot. 
living in the redneck world. Because we are living in a redneck world. Yeah, it happens all the time. People shoot around here all the time. That's good. Which of my issues would I like to unravel first? <laughs> right. <clears throat> Typically what I do with people that are private coaching clients, <clears throat> excuse me, is we start with the issue that won't go away. The one that you've worked on and it keeps coming back and it keeps coming back. Or someone outside of you is saying you have this issue. Or several people outside of you are saying you have this issue but you can't see it. But you have a suspicion that something's there. That's usually where we start. So, of course this would be like the longest chapter. Yeah. Chapter 8. The supreme good is like water, which nourishes all things without trying to. It is content with the low places that people disdain. The low places that people disdain, my interpretation of that is emotions. We disdain them. They, we think of emotions as being down deep, right? When we talk about our emotions, we talk about it in our gut, which is lower than our head. We talk about going deep, diving deep, going, you know, I feel this at the bottom of my heart or whatever. So my interpretation of that is the low places that people disdain is the emotional parts that we don't want to deal with. Clear mind, the supreme good is like water. It is beautiful and pro profound. The nourishment that feeds all things internally without trying to. A clear mind is by its very nature a place of humility. Hi, Sarah. It loves the low places. It prefers being in the audience to being on stage. Though when people put it in the spotlight, it loves that too. It lives at the feet of everything else because it is everything else. So they're talking it in terms of it more as being humble. That position of student rather than teacher. Even if you're the teacher. Um, a lot. We're, we're about three quarters of the way done, I think. But we had a good discussion, so I hope you can catch the replay. Darn it. We're talking about pain versus suffering and how we create our own suffering. And how we say we're letting stuff go, but we may not always be actually letting stuff go. Oh, gosh darn it. That's happening to several people. It's so aggravating. Maybe I just need to send out a massive Twitter notice. Okay, let's get to this. In its gratitude at being everything beautiful, it bows at the feet of the master we call stone, bush, beggar, ant, grass. It finds itself as the bird soaring overhead and doesn't know how to fly, but notices it's flying anyway. So did you catch that? A clear mind loves the low places. It lives at the feet of everything beautiful. It bows at the feet of the master that we call stone, bush, beggar, ant, grass. All of those things are masters. All of those things we can live at the feet of and learn from. When the mind is clear, life becomes very simple. I have the thought to stand up and do the dishes. How childlike it is to move to the sink, uh, to the kitchen, to the sink. I turn the handle, experience the water on my hands, pour some liquid soap onto a sponge. <clears throat> so she's discussing her being very mindful of the process. There is a lot of holiness in washing the dishes or doing the laundry if you allow there to be. I never know what anything's going to be. Without believing any thought of a future, there's no way of knowing what is me and what is the plate, the soap, the water, the world of bubbles and shine. What craziness could oppose such simplicity? 
The body rises, moves to the sink. Soap, water, shine. It's a beautiful story. It's all there is to life. It is the only life. Yes, me too. Or sometimes I'll call somebody to do the dishes. Yeah, it's a great way to clean, right? Listening to something and while you're doing cleaning is really cool. It gives your body something to do so you can hear things you might not hear otherwise. I'm happy to be this 63-year-old woman. I love that I weigh 160 pounds. I love that I'm not any smarter than I am. I love that my skin is getting wrinkled and loose. I love that some mornings I'm almost blind and there's just a haze of world and I can barely see where I'm going. I love where my hands have been put. I love how I am breathed and positioned and angled. Coping with being by yourself a lot, it helps. Good. Is your husband traveling? I love what I see now looking out the window. Trees, sky, lawn, brick, chimney, bougainvillea, house for sale sign, hedge, canal, ducks, and I can't separate one from the other. They're not separate. All those things that we just listed are not separate from each other until we label them. Um, trees, sky, lawn, deck, creek, cat, whatever. Um, when you're in a state of don't know mind or you're in a state of beginner mind and you can pretend for a moment that you don't know language, all those things are very clearly seen as one thing. Oh, I see. So a change in your life role, Rhonda. I love it that as I walk upstairs, my steps are not too fast, not too slow, not too far apart. I love how in their wisdom, my feet step on the perfect portion of floor in exactly the right rhythm. How miraculous their movement is. Can you imagine if you had to stop and think about every step that you climbed today? Every step that you went down, if you had to stop, look at it, analyze the angle. Um, put your foot down, stop again, analyze the next angle. But you don't. You just trust your body to do it. You know that it's going to do its job. We can trust our soul in the same way. We can trust life in the same way. We can practice knowing that if we just let it, everything will be fine. Everything will take care of itself. We can really do without doing. We can be like water, which nourishes all things without trying <clears throat> Excuse me. Why would I want to be you or someone else when we all can walk up a staircase, we all can stand and move in our own way? Why would I compare or compete? And like I said earlier, comparing and competing with yourself is almost just as bad. Comparing how I felt yesterday versus how I feel today leads me to worrying about how I'm going to feel tomorrow. So be careful that you're, when you're looking for compare and despair tendencies, comparing one day to the next, comparing this morning's experience to this afternoon's experience can be just as destructive. So taking that tendency to compare and really looking at where are you doing it all day. Comparing is nothing more then believing the story that a past would invent as a future. Okay? Comparing is nothing more than believing the story that a past would invent as a future. It's so much simpler to be what I am right now. A 49-year-old woman with a stuffy nose and a pain in her chest. That's it. That's it. It's so much simpler to be what I am as if I could be anything else. So I can tell myself I'm something different, but I'm not. That's the story. That's more wasted energy. And that my body would like to have all its energy available to heal with. Oh gosh, that's the end of the chapter. So, why would I compare or compete? Why would I want to be you or someone else? It's so much simpler to be what I am 
and I can't be anything else anyway. Your past experiences create future expectations. Yes. Yes, they do. <coughs> Keeps you away from the present, right? So I was talking earlier, Sarah, about how um, I caught some anxiety about having a cold and feeling a little bit worse than I did yesterday in some parts of my body, but a little bit better in other parts of my body. But then having this free-floating free anxiety, well, I guess it's not really free-floating if you can pin down where it comes from, but this anxiety that it's going to move into my lungs. Because in the past, it's moved into my lungs, and it's been a real problem. And I have stuff to do. I have babies to watch, and I have scopes I enjoy, and I have a book that has still not been written, and all these things. And I was like, ah, blah, blah, blah. you know, just getting all spun up in circles. When the truth is... Um, there's just pain here, and if I would stop stressing my body out, it could probably do a much better job of healing me, and it will heal me in the appropriate time. I don't have to push it and order it around. I support it with the oils. I support it with teas. I support it with rest when I can. I can support it even better. Right, it may not, but if it does, that will be okay too. We're okay if it moves into my lungs, I'll be okay. If it doesn't move into my lungs, I'll be okay. The story trips us at every turn. The storytelling we do uh, just hamstrings us and wastes so much energy. I was talking to the three that are going through the Desire Map workshop right now because typically by the end of the workshop, you're experiencing more energy. More physical energy because you are let you have spent five weeks letting go of your story. Oh yes, yeah, me too. <laughs> like it's real easy for me to sit here and tell you uh, all these things, and I try to use my own life as an example of like, oh, here, this is what it looks like. You wake up sick one day, and you catch yourself doing this comparison against you're comparing today against yesterday and potentially tomorrow, and that's how you can take. The, uh, the concept of comparison deeper but so, you know I catch myself doing the things I warn you guys against all the time that's how I know I know the potholes are there because I step in them frequently and I'm like oh hey back there there's a pothole I want to watch out oh and up there there might be another one <laughs> so silly So take a look at that today. That's the that's the thought that followed the thoughts when I woke up and I was all freaked out about being so sick this morning. Um, the thought that followed that was, this is comparison. I'm comparison. Comparisoning. I'm comparisonating. <laughs> I'm comparing <clears throat> yesterday to today. I don't need to do that. I can let today just be today. I don't need to comparisonate it. I can just let it be today. Yesterday is gone. I don't need to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's not here yet. If I keep all my energy here, I support my body better in my is what I think. But I need to be keeping all of my energy here anyway, whether I'm sick or not sick, because that's where I'm most effective in my life in general, is keeping my mind focused here today and sometimes I have to do that by just um, putting my awareness in my hands and and really like looking at my where my hands are if they're on the steering steering wheel or not right now they're on this book so if I'm holding something even if I'm just sitting like holding my own hands or whatever I put my awareness on my ring to just bring myself back to here and now if I catch myself wandering take a deep breath really be aware of my lungs really be aware of my breath and breathe and feel the texture of your hand or feel the texture of the book cover really look at the, the texture and the grain of your steering wheel those are little tricks that can help you bring your awareness back to the present moment wherever you were wandering off to so, um, yeah, I haven't watched yesterday's replay, but I want to, cause I don't remember a lot about it. 
but I want to see what the twins look like when I left the room to get the banana. <laughs> I might want to actually write that one down for them. <laughs> So, what questions do you have, if any? Thousand names for joy. Yes. Yes. Chapter 7. Let me flip back there. I've got it. Chapter 7 was, it was bor never born, thus it can never die. Each time a problem is solved, another problem pops up. I'm just going to read bits and pieces till we see your question. <clears throat> I think Periscope's going a little bit slow today. There's only the life of an unquestioned thought. There's only mind. After you think the thought, I'm going to die, where did that thought go? Isn't another thought your only proof that it's true? And who would you be without your story? Love and accept everything. How do I reconcile that with child protection situations? Excellent question. Love and accept everything. How do you reconcile that with child protection situations? And for those of you have, who haven't done child protection, you can think of any situation in your world where you're aware of child abuse or um a human sex trafficking with children, uh, the places in Thailand that steal children and buy children and use them for um, Americans to come over and abuse. Okay, so that's like super challenging. Um, but the way you do that is you, you walk that razor's edge. So you can't not, let's see, you can't be blind to the fact that terrible things happen. And you can't choose the right action to take if you're lost in their pain. First of all, children experience the pain of those things in a different way than we do in the witnessing of that pain. Uh, very young children may not even remember it if we get them out in time. The younger the child is, the sooner we get them out, the greater the chance of what we would call recovery. So one thing that used to keep me, as long as the child is alive, there's hope. Even if they're being trafficked, even if they've been part of a, a pornography ring or a um, prostitution ring, which they frequently are. There was a multi-state... Um... Oh, okay. There was a multi-state... Um prostitute child prostitution ring bust human trafficking whatever we know we don't need the details right we know it's horrible so if i see a child and i have in the worst condition that i can imagine my immediate reaction even when i was experienced was shock and horror right they don't have the context they have the immediate fear, and as soon as we get them out of there, their fear drops. And they, they will understand it differently as an adult. So let's just take a child protection situation. You first see them, and you're, or you first read their file, and you're shocked, and you experience that horror. And you may experience physical symptoms of a racing heart, or you hold your breath, or you start to cry, or, or whatever it is. You acknowledge that they are suffering and you are suffering with them. Um, typically, once you get a hold of them, the event is over and they aren't suffering. But now we're suffering because we're thinking about what it must have been like for them. Uh, we're thinking about times it may have been like that for us. So if we've experienced those things, we may go back into how I experienced it. <laughs> Here's the thing. In working with teenagers who've been sexually abused or physically assaulted, um, Cynthia, they see it differently. Some of them come out of it and they immediately recognize. They immediately recognize. Yes, we'll get to it. 
um, they immediately recognize that they can take their suffering and do something with it. They may not immediately recognize that and they may be caught up in bitterness and pain. We can't stop their pain. No. No. No, you don't have to love this scenario. What you love is that hope is always there. What you love is that you get to be a part of holding a vision of them being the best that they can be. So the best thing that you can do when you hear or see, directly see, a horrible scenario <clears throat> is go have your reaction, breathe deeply, breathe deeply, be with that pain, be with it. So, you know, there's some thought that we can share that pain and our breathing through it will help it dissipate for both of us. Then your energy is fully present to help with their healing process, whatever that may be. Here's what I used to tell myself too, and I still believe it to this day. Some people who do the most amazing work in the world as adults went through some pretty hellish things as children. So that's where we have to leave it up to God. That's, we have to, that's where we have to leave it up to their destiny. If someone is bleeding in front of you, you do what you can to patch them up. And then you hold a vision and you hold the hope of their skin being healed and strong again. And you remember that as long as there are, they are breathing, there is endless hope. Children are so strong. They're so resilient. They will bounce back from some of the most horrific things that we can imagine. And we can support them in that by not letting our pain add to theirs. So I experienced a, more than one time where I had to really catch myself and remember, you know, excuse myself and go to the bathroom and remember all this stuff real quick. So that I could go back and be with a two-year-old and be like, God, this is, you're okay now. That was scary. Wow, that probably hurts. The doctor's going to fix it up for you. And then we're going to get you help and we're going to, um, you know, and we're not going to gloss, you know, we don't make promises that we can't keep. And we don't say, everything's going to be okay because it sure isn't. Once child protection is involved... It's not going to be okay. And in fact, for a while, it may be worse than what they were experiencing at home. Yes. But allow your pain. So if you guys were here the other day when I said if, and you may not have been, if we're hiking together and I fall and break my leg, I need your legs to be strong to help me survive. If I break my leg and you come after me and then you fall and break your leg, we're both dead. So you can experience the pain of seeing me in pain and being like, God, this is horrible. And you fight against it and you do all those things and you let all that roll through and you say, then you say to me, Michelle, your leg is broken. That sucks. And that hurts. And I'm going to be like, yeah, it hurts. Don't break your leg to fix mine. Yes. Keep your leg strong so that you can pull me up. So that you can put your arm around me and we can hobble out of the forest together. If we let the children's pain destroy us, we can't help them. If we let their pain douse our light, then we can't be the lighthouse for them that says, yes, this is awful horrible thing happened to you and there's hope yeah it's not helpful it's not helpful yeah if it, you cry with me for a minute and then we figure out what we're going to do so you cry with children and you cry for their situation because it's horrible it's so horrible 
And then you remember what you just said about they're resilient. Yes, it's horrible. And we can do something about it. Yes, they suffered. Yes, they are suffering. And I'm here. It is what she wants. Because she doesn't push against it. When the pain comes, it's what she wants because she wants to be in love with what is. I don't want people to hurt people, but they do. And we don't know why they do, and we don't know what may come of that. The fact that you are in that child's life, you're there for a reason. You have something to give that child. You may be the one person that that child hangs on to forever in their mind as a friendly face. You be in love with the reality of people hurting other people because it is, it happens. If you fight against it, you shut yourself off from the love that can heal the situation. Let me think of how I can say this. Being connected to God, or what you call grace, being fully aware of grace means that you don't waste that connection. You don't disconnect by hating the situation. If you hate the perpetrator that did that to the child, you've lost your connection to grace, which means you've lost your power. Um... And if you're connected to grace, you are going to feel love. So you're going to feel love that the perpetrator did is in so much pain that they are hurting others. And you're going to feel love for the child that is suffering because you know they'll be okay. You know that they can come out of it. You'll know that the perpetrator is in pain and causing pain and there is also hope for him or her too. Now whether or not they take is not it's not up to us. But you're there to offer it. You're there to offer strength. Um who was it that did the video the other day that said water doesn't worry about ice. Yes, if you focus on your connection to grace and not the pain or the perps, you have to do both. Let me say this as clearly as I can. You have to do both. Because you're a human woman with a huge heart. Sometimes we hurt more for the perpetrator than the child. Compassion for the perpetrator. Love and hope for all. Yes, we love it all. She falls in love with what is because she doesn't want to lose. Her connection to God is so valued and so powerful and she knows it. So she knows that if she doesn't love everything that's coming toward her, she will lose that connection. And that connection is the only place she can be of benefit. I can't be of benefit to you if I'm lost in your heartache. Yes, you're hating God along with the darkness. It is very hard for me to love someone that would put a pilot in, the, in a metal cage and set him on fire. So what Byron Katie says about stuff like that is the pilot has died. He suffered and he died and he's gone now and he's back with God. And my continuing to play his story in my mind keeps me from being connected to God. Yes, yes, I know, I know when you say hate, that's not what you mean. It's this incredible deep sorrow, um, I think sorrow is um, a word that encapsulates the things that you experience. Grief is love. Sorrow is love. It's very hard work. It's very hard work. So the more that you can dis... Okay, so let me... Here's, here's my prescription. <laughs> you see the child... So at some t sometimes I was seeing the children in the ER. So they were freshly, they were a fresh mess. And they had evidence of old incidences all over them. Like, just awful. I, I don't even talk about what I saw because it just puts pictures in people's heads. So 
let's just say it was horrible. I experienced the pain of their pain because you're empathic, because you have a huge heart, because you're sensitive. You feel their pain. You feel it. You acknowledge it. You have your tears about it. You may go home and write about it. You give that, their pain coming into you, you give it a place to go. And by doing so, you open your way back to grace. Sometimes hate is sadness. Sadness is heartache. Loving is sometimes painful in the body. Yes. Our bodies react to it. <clears throat> the feeling of strong connection to God sometimes makes my body physically uncomfortable and I find it hard to handle. But I keep stretching that. So you acknowledge the pain. You acknowledge the hate. You acknowledge the um, anger. Um, all that mix and mess of emotions that you feel in Child Protection, Cynthia, you acknowledge it. Oh my God, I hate this right now. This is bullshit. This is awful. You know, I let it come in and breathe through it as if you're giving birth. Let it come in and breathe and breathe and breathe and breathe. And when you do, it comes through and then your connection to God just your awareness of it comes back and you go, okay, where do we go now? Lead me where to go now. Maybe I need to just hold this toddler right now until the nurse comes back. Maybe I need to uh, get on the phone. Maybe the toddler's okay with the nurse and I need to start making calls to find a foster home or a family member. Um, breathing, breathing, breathing. Letting it move on through. Letting it be like water and flow on through you will bring you back to the place where you can take a higher look and say, I don't know what's going to happen to these people. Yes. No, 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 no. Don't beat yourself up for not fully loving what it is. You can't. In that moment, you can't. Healing versus me having these things happening to me. Yes. You should never judge yourself for your immediate reaction. Um, we get in so much trouble that way because we, we want to push it away because we feel like we're not reaching for that higher level. We can't get there until we go through this first. So you have your reaction. And you love it. You love yourself. That your heart is so big that you feel this pain. That your love is so huge that you want to stop it. You want to stop this from happening to these people. You acknowledge all of it. I hate you. I love you. I want to kill you. I want to hang you from the highest tree. I want you to find grace so that you get better. I, w I wish this had never happened to you. I wish that I could take this all from you. But I can't. So I'm going to have my reaction. I'm going to feel my rage. I'm going to feel my soul-sucking sorrow. I'm going to feel all that. And then I'm going to just go, okay, where do we go now? What needs to happen here now? What can love through me bring to these people now? And they take it or they don't. And that's where your responsibility stops. You ask yourself, what wants to happen here? What does grace want to happen here Move through me, Grace, and bring to this situation whatever needs to happen through me. I am willing. I am open. I am a channel for your love. Use me to bring to this situation whatever is best for all of us. All of us. The perpetrator, you, the victim, the child. Let's not call him a victim. The child. Whoever witnessed the abuse, often it's the mother that, often it's the father is the perpetrator, but not always. Sometimes the child is a perpetrator on another child. We know that. You acknowledge all of it. That's what she means by saying, it comes and she, it's what she wants. She wants the truth. She wants the truth, the truth with a capital T. And truth with a capital T looks like blood, looks like joy, looks like broken bones, looks like angel wings, 
looks like flowers blooming, looks like forest fires. It's all one. And she loves it because she knows it's the truth. The truth of the child is that they will bounce back and you are in a privileged position to help them do that. The truth for the perpetrator is that they will have an opportunity to help. Yes, I know you do. I know you want truth. When we hate, we're trying to separate ourselves because it hurts. The more you can feel the pain, the less you separate from it. Because you learn that it's just pain. It's just pain. It rolls in, it rolls out. It's just sorrow. It rolls in, it rolls out. It's just rage. It comes in, it goes away. It comes in and goes out. You don't reject any of it. That's the truth. Truth is sometimes what we call ugly. But it just is. It's just that thing. We are not separate from those who cause the pain. Yes, we are not separate separate. From the man who sells his child into a prostitution ring. Or we're not separate from the man who buys the child from the prostitution ring. That's a hard one. We're not separate. When you love what is, you're awake. Not everybody chooses it. Not everybody chooses to be awake. We do. Those who hurt are hurting too. And that includes you. So let yourself hurt. Let yourself experience what I call the petty place. <laughs> Go to the petty place. Go to the rageful place. It's your human reaction to a human situation. At the same time, you have the connection to grace and the knowledge that ultimately it's all going to be okay. So the Kevin, uh, Kevin Kyle sees... Google him, K-Y-L-E, last name, C-E-A-S-E. I apologize that my nasalness is making things sound strange, but he said, water doesn't worry about ice. Thank you, Linda. Water doesn't worry about ice. It knows it's not separate. It knows it will eventually return to be water. Ice thinks it's separate. Ice in water thinks, I'm ice, that's water. It's not so. It's not so. Water will water is ice in a different form. I heard that about an analogy about that about God wants to, or that about spirit, and I don't remember who told me. Um, water can be flowing water. Water can be ice. Water can be rain. Water can be snow. It's all the same water. Water can be ocean water. It can be river water. You can be falling on your face. You can be stepping in it with your feet. It's all the same. It's all water. Different forms. Same water. Perpetrators and victims. Same water. Could be mud. Yeah. Still water. Does that help? Cynthia, please feel free to email me anytime you need support um, for any of that stuff. I'm totally happy to help. Um, support you in that. All right, emails caddyshackdesigns at gmail dot com, and that goes for anybody. If you guys hit a situation where you're like, I don't see how this fits. I don't see how the things that we talk about in the morning apply to this situation. Email me, and I'll help you figure it out. It's tricky and not tricky. It's simple and complicated. Be very kind to yourself too. Don't let yourself get lost. Yeah. We're all blessings to each other. Thank you. I love this group too. I really do. I love when you guys feel safe enough or um, to bring up a question and we can work through it. Because that benefits everyone, Cynthia. Your question benefits all of us. Everybody on here is having that, that similar confusion with how do we apply that to terrorism how do we apply that to the suicide bombers how do we how does this work in that good 
Thank you, Cynthia. It's a challenging thing to go through the day without labeling, but when we do, we see life so clearly. It's a practice. These things are called a lifelong practice for a reason. They are a lifelong practice. You're very welcome. Oh, yeah. Pain is pain. Pain is pain. Emo tower rooms long ago witnessed young kids with drugs and needles. Yep. Yep. You cried for them all the time. Yeah. I want to. I hope I don't ever lose that ability to cry or get mad or feel sorrow. I had a friend once who insisted that, yes, of course, that through A Course in Miracles we would reach a utopia where we only felt joy. I absolutely disagree with that. Yeah, you want to call their parents? Yeah. Um, I don't think that there is a utopia where we only feel joy. I think we start to feel joy in everything because we stop labeling it. I don't. I want to feel truth. I want to feel a full range of emotions. Right? There's no utopian existence. Yes. Oh, that's, it hurts, Cynthia. It hurts so much. The heart breaks again and again and it hurts. It hurts. It'll break open in tears. It'll break open in rage. It'll break open in homicidal impulses toward the, the people who caused the damage. I would probably feel only joy if I could. <laughs> it's not going to happen, honey. <laughs> you can feel only joy. It's called Xanax. Truth is uh, God made manifest. The truth of what's happening is um, spirit in action. She is so cute. <laughs> so adorable. Mother Teresa used to say, Jesus, what an interesting face you're showing to me today. When she encountered someone who had done something bad that we call bad. When she encountered someone who um, was being mean to her. Yeah, in her head she would say, Wow, Jesus, what an interesting face you're wearing today. To help herself remember The perpetrator is God walking around in the world doing perpetrator things. The people being perpetrated on is God walking around experiencing victimhood. <clears throat> yeah. Wow, Jesus. That's quite a face you've got on today. <laughs> wow. Wow, Jesus, you've dressed yourself up as a suicide bomber today. Isn't that interesting? What are you doing? And we don't, and like Sarah said, and I've said, and that's how I raised my daughter, we don't know. We don't know that what happened isn't exactly what should have happened. What was supposed to happen, we just, that's God's business. Your business, my business, spirit's business. And I gotta stay in my business. If I stay in my business, I can do, I can be the vessel for God's business. I can be the answer to someone's prayer, but I got to stay in my business first. I got to tend to my own home front first. So yeah, don't don't judge yourself. Nobody judge yourself for feeling shitty or rageful or mean or petty or whatever. When you judge yourself, you create shame and shadow. You don't want to do that. When you judge yourself for it, you push it aside, and it has to go hide in the darkness. And it's a problem for you later. Might as well just go on and acknowledge that you want to commit murder sometimes or you want to hurt someone back. Yep. Tending to the self is tending to God. Tending to your home front is tending to God. Yep. Much better way to say that. I tend to me and I tend to God. I make myself an altar. I make my own body a sacred space. I make my own... Yeah, tending to others first is definitely ego. Gotta take care of yourself, too. So, 
going to take my nasally voice and um, go read a book probably. So we're just hanging out here today and I'll get up in the morning and go um, take care of twins tomorrow. They're such, they're so fun. Yay! Have a good day. Thanks for bringing that to us and give us the opportunity to discuss it for everyone. <clears throat> Definitely. Heading for a rest. I'm heading to go rest. Love you guys so much. Thanks for discussing these deep things. Yeah, that's really good. I like that. Um, have Cynthia come. <laughs> Thank you. Love you guys. Have a great day. See you tomorrow. <laughs>